Welcome to our, ladies and gentlemen, to our 59th annual general meeting. Before I go any further, I would just like to give a personal thanks to three trustees who are retiring after this AGM. They are Mary Parker, Paul Tyler and Tim Pynchon. They have done really fantastic service over the last few years, so thank you very much indeed. Right, on with the show. Welcome to the 59th AGM. This is, as Debbie has said, certainly got some unique features. Uh, the obvious one is it's online, yes. Another one is that we now have 256 attendees, which is easily a record for any AGM attendance. And uh, it's the first one held in an evening, to my knowledge. So how much uh, of the high attendance is due to the fact that we are not competing this week with Autumn Watch. We're not competing with Mr. Packham. So uh, thank you all for attending in interesting circumstances. And uh, if there is the odd hiccup, then please uh, give us some forbearance and we'll try and fix things. Now, there is one other feature of this evening, which is quite interesting. In 18 days time, this society, our Wildlife Trust, will be 60 years old. And uh, it's certainly cause for some sort of celebration. And we had the first inaugural meeting on the 28th of February in Winchester in 1960. So I think on a normal AGM we would spend some time looking backwards and uh, highlighting some of our successes. And certainly the trust has gone from strength to strength over those six decades. But this has been a most interesting last year and I'm not talking about the pandemic. The last AGM was held just before Wilder Conference. And many of the activities that the officers have undertaken in the last year have originated in that conference. And so rather than spend time this evening in looking backwards, we are going to focus a lot of the time looking forwards and so that will be Debbie's report to you after the formal meeting. Right, item four and that is the, ti the time to look at the year 2019 to 2020. There is an annual report, it looks like that with a beautiful picture of a Duke of Burgundy fritillary on the front. It's on the website. So you've had, a, I think it's been there about three weeks. So there has been chance for you to look at it. We will report against that in two sessions. The first will be by David Jordan, the chairman, looking at what the trust has done. And then Mary Parker, the treasurer, will report against the financial side of that report. So I will invite David Jordan, our chairman of the board, to give his report. David. Thank you very much indeed, John, and um, good evening, uh, everybody. And as John says, welcome to our, um, our AGM in this uh, very, very unusual format. Uh, I've got a small number of slides which will help me to talk through the uh, some of the key elements of the 2019-20 financial year and I'll ask in each case for the, the slides to be moved forward. So could I have the next slide please? So just to reflect very briefly on 2019-20 uh, 
I'm very pleased to be able to say that this was another extremely successful year for Hampshire Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. I characterize it as being a good balance of doing the things that we do best, looking after our nature reserves for the benefit of wildlife and people, influencing and inspiring a new generation, working with partners to support their efforts to enhance and protect wildlife in our two counties, developing our wilder strategy and acquiring new land for wildlife. In previous years, I've been able to say one of the great things about this trust is the leadership team. Uh, it's an unchanged team and I'm delighted to be able to say again that I believe this trust, I know this trust, to be extremely well led and well managed with very strong sound financial management. Another key feature I think of the last year has been the steadfast support that we've received from uh, members, partners and a wide range of other supporters. Next slide, please. So let me talk a little bit about growing our estate. Over the last two or three years now, we've done a huge amount of work on the Isle of Wight, which has been quite fantastic. I've been absolutely delighted again last year with two new key acquisitions. Um, and the one that you see here may well be a site where we may introduce, reintroduce badges. We're currently working on that from a scientific perspective and also from a, uh, a consultation perspective. Please do ask us questions about that, perhaps later on in the, in the session. And this was enabled by a very generous legacy, uh, a, a very successful appeal and the support of two uh, key partners. Next slide, please. In Hampshire, we were absolutely delighted to be able to acquire Deacon Hill. Although it took place in, uh, after the end of the last financial year, all the work in preparing for that acquisition took place last year. It's a site which many of you know we've been very, very keen to acquire over many, many years, and we could not miss this opportunity. It's a fabulous site, not least because uh, it's a stronghold for the Duke of Bur Burgundy butterfly, and it's a vital link in our nature recovery network, again made possible by a very generous legacy gift, a fundraising appeal which was fantastic, and financial support from a range of partners including the County Council. Next slide please. Flourishing wildlife, we've had some fantastic successes. Um, for example, uh, down um, on the coast we've had a great year for uh, for avocets, where re record numbers, or at least the best in at least 20 years, oyster catchers breeding for the first time. A lot of really dedicated, careful, thoughtful work has gone into the management of our sites so that they do their best for wildlife and, of course, for our members and for other people. So it's been a very good year from, uh, from that perspective on our wildlife sites. Next slide, please. I talked earlier about influencing. We've given farm advice across um, a very wide range of, of, um, of farmland now. It's crucial that we focus not just on our own land, but of course also where others uh, can bring their own management practices to bear. Uh, our new forest native, um, non-native plants initiative reached its 10th birthday, it's done some fantastic work and um, reached the attention of, of government ministers uh, in, in a very good way. Uh, of course, uh, the attention of government ministers in my own history isn't necessarily uh, always a great thing, but one hopes it is, and it certainly was uh, in this case. Our ecology work has grown uh, with new partners, and we've shared aspirations to bring back missing species, and I think this will be a key feature uh, of our plans going forward. And we launched our Nature-Based Solutions Programme, what does that mean? Well, very briefly, because Teddy will talk about this in a bit more detail. 
think what nature can do for reducing flood risk, what nature can do for reducing pollution, what nature can do for sequestering carbon uh, to reduce the impacts of climate change. Next slide, please. Working with communities is a crucial feature of our role and has grown, I'm delighted to say. Our Watercress and Winterbournes project was awarded very close to two million pounds by the National Lottery, which is quite fantastic. Our Secrets of the Solent project grew and we now have over 100 marine champions doing exactly what I believe we should be doing uh, as a trust with a significant uh, marine impact. Wilder Portsmouth uh, project is growing and our team Wilder, just within the first two months, signed up 31 Wilder champions, 104 Team Wilder Facebook uh, group members and 10 Wilder community groups. Again, be lovely. Uh, Debbie will talk, of course, much more about this in the second half of our, our meeting. Next slide, please. Campaign for a Wilder Future. I think it's fair to say that although, of course, an understanding of climate change, climate crisis is not new, understanding of the biodiversity decline and the catastrophic reduction in wildlife numbers is not new. I think it's fair to say that the awareness has grown enormously just in the last couple of years. Our own strategy, of course, is our response to this. 12,000 people took part in a, a parliamentary event. You can see here in the photograph your, your president, your chief executive and your chairman who took part in that event, which was both very serious and also good fun. Most of our local councils have declared a climate emergency. I think it's fair to say in many cases uh, we look to see the real impact of that, but I'm hoping that we can work with and influence those uh, as they develop. Our goal, as you know, is to see 30% of land and sea in recovery for nature by 2030, and that is a crucial element of our wilder strategy. Next slide, please. So those handful of slides really cover the financial year up until the end of March, but I felt that I couldn't uh, reflect as chairman without covering some of the things, principally coronavirus, that have taken place since the end of the financial year. Like practically everybody else and every other organisation on this planet, we were affected. Almost immediately we had to reduce or cut down or stop some activities, education, public engagement where it required face-to-face, face-to-face recruitment of, our, uh, of members, which has had an impact in terms of overall membership recruitment. Although I'm happy to say that other forms of um, uh, membership recruitment have performed strongly and we have been able to get back to work. We furloughed uh, quite a number of staff, as you can imagine, because their work came to an end and that financial support through the furlough scheme was crucial in terms of managing our finances through this crisis. And I say crisis, although it was not a crisis for us. It has been very big. It has required new ways of working, fundamentally new ways of working, some of which, of course, you're actually seeing tonight. Uh, but I'm very pleased to say, you know, there's one other thing I ought to mention, and that is we saw very regrettably some very poor behaviours on our, many of our reserves, uh, which were accessed by people who simply didn't respect wildlife. And I think that's quite an important element. And I think it's really crucial that people have access to green space um, in a way that doesn't have a negative impact on, on wildlife. But I'm very happy to say that the team itself led the trust through this crisis and is continuing to lead the, the trust uh, through this crisis. And it has been very effectively and very capably managed. And my last slide, please. Now, given the background that I've talked about, the disastrous decline in, in wildlife, the huge challenges of uh, climate emergency, climate crisis, whatever we want to call it, the problems of coronavirus, I actually feel hugely positive about the future of our trust. 
As I say, we are extremely well led and well managed. We have a huge supporter base in our partners and in our members. The support has been quite fantastic this year. The prospects are really, really good. We've got some very, very exciting initiatives uh, planned, driven by our wilder strategy, created by a wide range of opportunities for land acquisition, for rewilding, reintroducing species, inspiring a new generation. So I feel very, very positive indeed. I'd like to finish my chairman's presentation uh, firstly by thanking the members for your support and secondly by thanking, as John did in his opening remarks, three of my fellow trustees who are standing down at today's AGM. Mary Parker, our treasurer, Tim Pynchon and Paul Tyler. All three of those were trustees when I joined the Wildlife Trust and I've learned a huge amount from them. As chairman, I've benefited enormously uh, from their advice. But I know that the input and the difference they've made to the trust is huge and will be long lasting. And I do fully intend to stay closely in touch with them. And I know they will continue, <coughs> continue to support the trust uh, in other capacities. That concludes my chairman's statement, uh, John, and I'd like to hand back to you. Thank you very much. On behalf of the membership then, David, thank you very much indeed. Could I very briefly come in? For some reason, I said badgers when I meant beavers. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything worse that I could possibly have said. Can I set people's mind at rest here, please? We are not intending to seek to reintroduce or introduce badgers onto the Isle of Wight. It, it is beavers and we are consulting carefully. Profound apologies. Right. We'll now move on to item five on the agenda. And I welcome Mary Parker to give her treasurer's report. Mary. Good evening. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. Yes, here we are. Um, I haven't got quite so many pretty pictures as David, I'm afraid. My duty tonight is to report on the financial results for the year ended 31st of March 2020. And um, I will also briefly at the end talk a bit about the last six months. The annual report and accounts are prepared, obviously, in accordance with the accounting rules for a charitable company. And I'm glad to say we've had a clean audit report from Sheen Stickland. <laughs> um, the accounts are the responsibility of the trustees, but as always, they've been prepared by our Director of Finance and Resources, Natasha Thornelow and her team. And this year, she had to do it all in lockdown by remote working. Not at all easy, so a big thank you there. So looking at the year, we ended with total assets of 11.2 million more than half of which were land and buildings. We made a surplus of nearly one and a half million, made up of an increase of 1.477 million in restricted funds and a reduction of 7,000 pounds in unrestricted funds. And I'll explain what those are in a minute. I know a lot of you look at the investments figure and I'm sorry to have to report that we made an unrealized loss of £60,000 on our investments. And that was entirely due to the impact of the COVID crisis in March 2020. Next slide, please. So looking first at income, income for the year was 6.4 million, a million up on the previous year. And that was made up of 4 million of unrestricted income and 2.4 million of restricted income. Next slide, please. Now, unrestricted income is the income that can be used as trustees decide to support our charitable objectives. Unrestricted income for the year was just under 4 million, the same as the previous year. It includes membership income up 7.5% to 1.2 million. And membership numbers also increased 
by 3.4%. Legacy income was 376,000. It's a very important, though obviously unpredictable, source of income. We had unrestricted donations of 260,000, which was supporting all aspects of our work and activities. And we have an Arc Arcadian Ecology. It's our consultancy and ecology subsidiary company. They made a profit of 78,000, and that was covenanted across to the trust. Next slide, please. Now, the second sort of income is restricted income. And this is income where the donor specifies what he wants it, us to spend it on. And the total this year increased by a million to 2.4 million. And this includes funding for major projects and some of it received in advance and to be spent in future years. And the purchase of new church moors, which David mentioned, added £356,000 to restricted funds. And that was funded through an appeal and the balance coming from legacy income. Next slide, please. And here are the income trends over the last five years. Green is total income. The blue is unrestricted income. And the red is restricted income. Next slide, please. Now, expenditure for the year was 4.8 million, and that's just 50K lower than the previous year. Conservation work was a bit lower than the previous year, and that was due to projects coming to an end, as they do, and some winter work being delayed by the bad weather. Expenditure increased in other areas such as membership and in policy advocacy and engagement. And that included the start of our work on the Wilder campaign. And expenditure also included an upgrade of our IT infrastructure. And that provided the bonus of improving support for the remote working that we suddenly needed during the COVID lockdown and beyond. Next slide, please. Looking at the analysis of our expenditure, 88% of it was on our charitable activities, the conservation work, education and engagement, and advocacy and membership services. And the remaining 12% was spent on raising funds. And included in both of those figures are the related support costs, finance, human resources, IT, facilities, and governance which came to 880,000 pounds. Often regarded just as an overhead, but these are absolutely essential parts of us doing our job. And support costs also include our annual contribution to the Wildlife Trust at national level for the policy, advocacy, and coordination work they do on behalf of all the individual wildlife trusts. Next slide, please. And here, just so you can see it, uh, the graph, similar graph of our expenditure trends over the last five years, total, unrestricted, and restricted. Next slide, please. Now, investments have been a subject of interest for the last couple of years. And as reported last year, in the autumn, we transferred our investments to the CCLA Charities Ethical Investment Fund. Over the years, CCLA have offered very good returns to their charity and other clients. And they screen systematically over a wide range of areas, including biodiversity and climate change. And they work actively with companies on ethical issues of all sorts. From December 2019, they took the further step of not investing in companies producing or refining oil and gas. So they actually at that point, I think, dis disposed of the last two remnants of holdings in oil companies. 
and CCLA continue to restrict investment in companies with high carbon footprints which don't comply with the Paris Agreement. And as I mentioned before, the unrealized loss of investments uh, happened in March as a result of the COVID crisis. And I'm glad to say that that loss has been more than made up by the mid-year point and by now. Next slide, please. I said I'd talk briefly about the impact of COVID. David has covered a lot of this, but both the year end and the current financial year have been dominated by the COVID crisis. And we've had to take robust financial management measures to ensure costs are kept under control. Starting even before the actual new financial year started, we've regularly reforecast our income and expenditure and we will continue to do so. And these forecasts are not just a matter for the finance team or even just for trustees, they involve the whole executive team looking at all of their activities and making sure that costs are kept under control. So thank you to them too. We've also applied for external emergency funding and that includes local authority grants, and funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the government's furlough scheme, all of which have been very important. Face-to-face -face recruitment was stopped during lockdown and it did resume in August in line with COVID guidelines. And obviously some work, as David mentioned, was postponed and other activities were adapted for delivery online, as I expect you've seen. Next slide, please. So what does it all mean for us? The COVID situation continues to dominate, but we've got a huge amount of important work underway. And we know that the biodiversity and climate change crises haven't gone away. It's a very exciting time for the Trust, but looking ahead, we've also got financial challenges to overcome and continued uncertainties to manage including the ongoing COVID crisis, the ending of the Brexit transition period in January, and the government's complete revamp of the agricultural and environmental support mechanisms. So we will continue to maintain our strong budgetary control and continue our drive for new and diversified sources of income. And we're really grateful to our loyal members and supporters because it is you who enable us to continue the work to meet our charitable objectives. Next slide, please. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, and thank you for your dedicated service to the Trust. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a nice swan song you've had. <laughs> right, I would like to hand over to Debbie for you to take us forward, Debbie. Thank you. So with the formal business of the AGM completed, it's now over to me to reflect on the year uh, since we launched our wilder strategy and what the future holds. So if we could start the slides now, please, um, and then I will begin. Thank you. First slide, please. Our 10 year vision and strategy, Wilder 2030, was launched, as many of you will know, uh, this time last year at our AGM and conference. Uh, many of you joined for what was an absolutely brilliant event. It was such a proud and important moment for me and for the Trust. And this plan was developed over a year or more of consultation and discussion with our members and supporters and key partners and it's our local response to the global nature of climate emergency. We said that 2020 would be a real turning point, but I don't think we quite realized uh, how much that statement would ring true. Obviously the coronavirus pandemic, but also I think the increasingly scary pace of environmental destruction. And we know now that business as usual is no longer an option. And even though we are just a local charity, I think we can make a very important contribution to this global emergency and really play a role. 
Next slide, please. I'll just remind you of our vision, mission and aims, which we developed, as I said, talking to many of you over a year. And I did set out these briefly last time and hopefully some of you will also have read our, our plans. But in a nutshell, our vision is for a wilder Hampshire and Isle of Wight. And our headline goal is to put nature into recovery. More than protect, we really need to turn the tide now. And this bold vision requires, we think, three things. One, more people on nature's side. We aim to inspire and empower one in four people to act in support of nature across the two counties. Two, more space for wildlife to thrive, achieving at least 30% of our land and sea, which is protected and in recovery for nature. And to put that in context, that's about three times what we have today, if you count uh, proper wildlife sites that are protected. And three, the pressure on the environment reduced everywhere else by creating more sustainable economies and reducing our impact on the natural world. I didn't realise last year that our strategy would align so well with others. And when Craig Bennett started as our new UK CEO of the Wildlife Trust in the spring, he embraced the 30% concept as he launched our UK wide campaign 30 by 30. Other NGOs and organisations such as RSPB, IUCN, are now all calling for the same. So the 30% goal is well established. Even Boris Johnson said he wanted to see 30% of land and sea protected for nature recently. We have a slightly different definition, but still it was positive to hear. But before I tell you more about progress in our first year and our future plans, I must turn to more immediate events. Next slide, please. Yes, sorry, I'm also going to mention coronavirus. And just to reflect on lockdown, it was horribly tough for everyone and the trust was no different. We closed our offices in March, we sent staff home, as you've already heard, and we furloughed 40% of the team. But we couldn't furlough the reserve staff as our sites all remained open. And as restrictions started to ease in the summer, we saw an explosion of visitors and sadly a huge increase in antisocial behaviour on our reserves, as David mentioned earlier. This caused a great amount of distress and cost for the trust to deal with. I noticed one of you has asked a question about that, so perhaps we can cover that uh, a little bit later. But I wanted to also say we were really grateful, extremely grateful for the help we received from the press. We got great media coverage from volunteers, local people and the police who helped out with a whole heap of tasks from litter picking to crowd control and for the lottery funding which we were able to get to help pay for some of the repairs. We are now reviewing our staffing signage resources to see if we can deal more effectively with visitor pressure on our sites going forward and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a policy context later on. Next slide please. But lockdown had a positive side too, as we were confined to our homes and gardens and local neighbourhoods, the importance of nature was evident. A record 22,000 people took part in 30 Days Wild this year, which is a massive jump up from usual. And public attitude surveys that we undertook and others did too, showed consistently significant increase in public support for nature and for a green recovery after the pandemic. The benefits that nature brought to us all during lockdown were clear. Nature kept us safe, grounded and refreshed our spirits in these unprecedented and scary times. Nature's value has never been more appreciated and we need to build on this vital hook to help secure more support for its recovery going forward. Next slide, please. So back to our strategy. Our Team Wilder programme that we launched in January now seems more apt than ever. So as I said, our headline goal is to influence one in four people to act in support of nature. And this programme is an approach rooted in behaviour change science, using nature connection, empowerment and movement building techniques to build a community of wilder champions, leaders and activists. We've seen a surge in interest and we now have 41 wilder champions and leaders, six wild schools, 19 wilder community groups, growing Facebook and online profiles and huge interest from local authority and business partners in our approach. Our aim is to support people to lead action themselves, not hand-holding, but encouraging and empowering, providing tools, resources, training, and most importantly, connecting people and groups with each other 
to build a community and a movement in support of nature and building a more sustainable way of life. Next slide, please. Lockdown forced us to move online. We had originally planned our Team Wilder communications and marketing in the usual way, face-to-face -face events, activities, training, workshops and meetings, none of which we were able to do at all during lockdown. But the team adapted incredibly quickly and created an impressive array of engaging digital content instead. From bringing nature to you to online training courses, weekly e-news, more social media content, you can see just how well this has worked with a huge 150% increase in engagement compared to the same period last year. This interest in nature is really encouraging as we start to build momentum across the two counties to help tip the balance for wildlife. Next slide, please. Our second flagship program is Wilder Land and Sea. Through this program, we will deliver, campaign for, and help others contribute to the overall goal of 30% of land and sea for nature. We aim to double our estate over the next 10 years, expand and grow our work with farmers, landowners and others, growing our professional services such as ecology and advice, work with others on major partnership projects like Secret of the Solent and Watercress and Winterbournes, call on partners such as councils to step up and contribute to 30% and reducing their impact, challenge those that need to do more to clean up their act, such as some of our water companies or polluting industries. Bring back missing species like beavers to drive ecosystem restoration. Deliver ambitious rewilding projects inspired by NEP in Sussex and promote nature-based solutions, which I'll come back to later. Next slide, please. As part of our strategy, we've been developing a number of area-based visions as well. One of the first of these is our vision for a wilder white. On the island, we have a whole host of opportunities coming together. We've been building our acquisitions for many years and now our complex of sites through the Eastern Yarr Valley, as David showed earlier, is an impressive wetland network, providing one of the best opportunities for beaver reintroductions in England. We've just completed a feasibility study and the results are very exciting. We're also acquiring sites across the chalk to reconnect downlands and rewild former arable land delivering major benefits for wildlife, but also helping soils to recover and removing pollution from the system. More about this later. We're also looking to restore recently lost farm and bird species, iconic birds like the Searle Bunting, which is an emblem of high nature value farming systems with a diversity of habitats. All of these projects and more will help to demonstrate what a wilder future looks like, and we hope it will attract significant investment. Next slide, please. So this brings me to nature-based solutions. The climate and nature emergency demand a bolder approach. We've got to mainstream nature's recovery if we're to do more. And one way to ramp up investment in nature is to position nature as a solution to some of the most pressing problems in society, like the health crisis, the climate crisis and the pollution crisis. And going back to what I said earlier, there needs to be a vital shift in how we value what nature does for us as we recover from the pandemic. All of the amazing benefits that nature gives us must now be recognised by decision makers, planners, local enterprise partnerships and others as underpinning the economic and social fabric of our counties. Next slide, please. Nature's role in supporting mental and physical health has come to the fore during the pandemic. And now we need to position it as a solution. We have a wealth of evidence to support this. And what better way to convince public health authorities and local authorities to invest in more green spaces close to where people live. There are some shocking inequalities in accessible green space in some of our urban areas. The increase in use of our sites illustrates this perfectly. We now need to work with our partners to create greener, wilder towns and cities and bring wildlife to the people. Next slide, please. When restrictions are lifted, we will resurrect volunteering and we aim to increase the opportunities for people to be active in nature as part of growing Team Wilder. Not only have there been calls to increase volunteering for the health benefits this brings, 
but also through Wildlife Link, there is a campaign to create a national nature service with investment in thousands of green jobs. We saw the beginnings of this idea with the government's £40 million Green Jobs Fund earlier this year. However, there will be much disappointment as the fund was oversubscribed by nearly seven times with £270 million worth of bids, showing just how much demand and potential there is for jobs in our sector. We're calling on the government to match their rhetoric about nature's recovery and a greener economy with appropriate levels of funding. Despite their warm words, the reality is rather different. An article just this morning described the sorry state of natural England, which has been cut to the bone over the last decade, suffering a £165 million drop in funding in 10 years. Public investment in conservation overall has fallen in real terms by 33% in five years. Making sure that statutory nature conservation bodies can do their jobs properly is fundamental and we couldn't achieve half of what we do without the support of Natural England and Environment Agency colleagues who work very hard and support the Trust. So we're supporting calls for them to be properly funded. As a country we must do better than this. Next slide please. Another vitally important problem of course is climate change. And with some of our, most of our local authorities declaring a climate emergency, it's surprising that natural climate solutions aren't featured more highly. Now it's no, uh, it's no um, substitute for energy and all the other efficiency measures that we need to make, but the science suggests that more than a third of our decarbonisation efforts could be realised through the restoration of habitats and soils to sequester carbon. Woodlands, grasslands, wetlands, coastal habitats like salt marsh and seagrass beds, so-called blue carbon, all have the potential to capture large amounts of carbon from the atmosphere and to lock it up. We've also seen real interest from the farming sector in regenerative farming techniques and restoring soils, and we are also exploring the potential for this blue carbon around our coastline. We are developing a proper carbon offer, and we hope to launch this early in the new year to attract investment from business, government and individuals looking to support the fight against climate change. Next slide, please. A recently developed nature-based solution is our nitrate reduction programme. Devised to help mitigate the impacts of pollution from planned housing, this approach takes polluting intensively farmed land in certain areas and converts it into natural habitats through a rewilding approach. Housing was on hold for months while a solution was found. And given the political pressure, threats of legal challenge and the real risks of our environmental protections being overrun, this convinced us how important it was to put forward a high quality solution. What's good is that houses that previously would have been built without any investment in nature or cleaning up pollution now have to do just this. Little Ducksmoor Farm on the Isle of Wight is the first site for this new type of nature-based solution and we'll be able to mitigate the impact of around a thousand houses but on top of that reduce pollution even further, create significant new spaces for wildlife and channel investment into nature. Next slide please. It's really important to us that our scheme is ethical and so we have a number of tests we screen for to ensure that we don't provide mitigation for developments that will cause great harm to the environment. We've already refused to provide mitigation for a number of developments that don't meet our tests and we are genuinely using this to try and raise the bar for better planning, including signposting to our new Building with Nature service. Next slide please. Our Building with Nature service is starting to roll out and this provides an important tool to influence and support good developments that deliver real biodiversity net gain and also well-being benefits for people and benefits for water quality and other environmental issues. You'll no doubt be aware of the government's planning reforms that aim to rip up our current planning rules and replace them with something simpler and more streamlined, which could be hugely damaging for nature. I won't go into details here, but we have put our response in. And as part of our response to these changes, we've called for a new designation, the Wild Belt, with powers to designate land for wildlife recovery and then channel investment towards it. No such mechanism currently exists. And if this is accepted, 
it could offer a step change for wildlife recovery in towns and cities and beyond. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Being solutions focused does not mean we won't challenge damaging developments and there are important red lines that shouldn't be crossed. Like the proposals for a super peninsula at Tipton West in Portsmouth Harbour, which could set a damaging precedent that housing need overrides the need to protect our most highly designated wildlife sites, which after all are just a tiny proportion of our land space. Not to mention the madness of reclaiming parts of the sea to build on when we're trying to tackle climate change and sea level rise. As one of the most densely populated cities in the UK, we can see that Portsmouth struggles to accommodate significant housing targets demanded by government. There is limited space and the existing infrastructure is under pressure. However, meeting housing needs cannot be used as an excuse to destroy some of Portsmouth's vital natural assets and ignore the important legal, legal safeguards that we have in place. So watch this space for our campaign with the RSPB against these unsustainable proposals coming soon. Next slide, please. In summary then, Nature's Recovery offers society a whole host of benefits, services and solutions. We're starting to open up really important conversations and generate interest from previously hard to reach partner organisations like city councils, businesses, the LEPs, green finance investors and others because of this approach. I think the potential is really exciting. And I wanted to mention at this point that we'll shortly be recruiting for the right people to join our new look conservation and science advisory panel to support us with advice and expertise as we move into these new and exciting areas of work. Next slide, please. And finally, I want to leave you with a donut. Perhaps this is instead of the cake we would normally serve you. Sorry for the bad joke. But seriously, donut economics is a concept gaining real traction. The idea that we can continue with exponential growth in a finite world is becoming discredited. Economic models need to change to recognise we have limited resources to support human life on this planet. There are a number of serious breaches in planetary boundaries that we can now measure, as well as shortfall in human well-being across the globe. We need to learn how to thrive with the resources we have or risk the consequences. And if you haven't read Kate Rayworth's book, Donut Economics, I would thoroughly recommend it. Next slide, please. If I might venture a connection here, I think there's a vital link between the nature-based solutions we've been discussing and talking about and starting to solve some of these problems of living within the donut. I'm really hopeful in the coming years we'll see a transformation in the way that we value and invest in nature to support not only our wildlife but ourselves. And as a trust we can play a role in helping to show how these approaches can work in a local context and in doing so create a wilder future for nature and for people. Next slide please. And that's all from me and I just wanted to say a huge thank you for all of your support, your encouragement and your faith and your belief that we can make a better future for wildlife. It means such a lot to me and all of my team. Thank you very much. Well I hope you um found this evening's AGM and subsequent uh, presentation and discussion uh, interesting and valuable. Uh, very, very much appreciate your attendance. It is undoubtedly a record attendance. I think if you add up the number of people logged in, plus those doubled up from home, it's, it's probably a good 300. I'd like to endorse uh, what John said, thanking the staff who've uh, put this evening's programme together. Having worked with them, uh, as we all have as, as panellists, over the last weeks to, to get this ready. I can tell you they've done a phenomenal amount of work and I hope it's worked well for you at home or, or, or wherever, wherever you are taking part. Thank you also to my fellow panellists, uh, but above all, thank you to the members for taking part in this year's AGM and to our supporters. And I wish you all, well, I can't even say safe journey home. Um, because with luck we haven't uh, got to um, uh, to go anywhere else tonight but if I may wish you all a safe future and on behalf of the panel thank you very much indeed and the meeting is now closed good night thank you goodbye